Hey, everyone. I hope you guys are still doing okay. Uh, let me begin by paraphrasing Mark Twain. Uh, the reports of me having the coronavirus are greatly exaggerated. Uh, there was a rumor going around, that's all I can say. Um, I had no idea that I looked that bad in these videos, so I'm trying to spruce up my appearance and get out of my den a bit to see if it helps me look any healthier. Uh, I must have aggravated a rib over the last couple of days because it's sore again, but, and work is getting uh, busier. And so I'm going to incorporate the study I've been doing from my couch uh, to my sermon. So we're going to be looking at Ephesians. Uh, thanks, thanks for the encouraging comments so far. And we're going to continue on in chapter 1 of Ephesians today, uh, starting with verse 11. And I'm going to leave out the predestination part this time because I talked about it earlier. And it's not essential for the meaning of what Paul is trying to say. He writes this, In Christ we have obtained an inheritance, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of His glory. I think a lot of time when we read this passage, we interpret this in the light of going to heaven when we die. But I don't think that's what Paul has in mind at all. Uh, this is not an inheritance for when we die. We receive an inheritance here and now because Christ has died and been resurrected. And if we are in Christ, we are also heirs to what he left us. When my dad died a couple of years ago, I didn't have to wait till I died in order to receive his inheritance. Um, and yet, from my perspective, I think that's how many people think about their inheritance in Christ. We're going to get it someday. But I believe the scripture says we have the inheritance now. We are the heirs of Christ now. We receive the gift of dying to ourselves with Christ so that we may live unto Christ. Yes, we will gain the fullness of our inheritance in the next age, but we can start inheriting the things that Christ provides for us the moment the Holy Spirit enters us, which is the moment we humble ourselves before God. All who believe are transformed by grace into a temple, the temple of the Holy Spirit. And not only are we a temple, but the Holy Spirit comes and fills us the moment we humble ourselves before God. Here is the inheritance. God abides in you if you are in Christ Jesus. You become a temple made without hands that is more filled with the Holy Spirit than the Old Testament tabernacle or temple combined. The Holy Spirit lives inside you permanently and His job is in there is to begin to produce the fruits, His fruits, in your life. The same fruit that I've been talking about in the last two videos, love, joy, patience, peace, patience kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And I know that you think that you can get those things in your own strength. People think they do that all the time. In fact, I bet you've been taught that to receive these things, you just have to buckle down and try harder. However, I'm not sure that there's ever been a bigger lie in Christianity than that one. You cannot produce the fruits of the Spirit in your own strength. If you do them in your own strength, you are producing artificial fruit. The fruit of the Spirit is one of the two reasons that the Holy Spirit lives inside you. The second is to give you the gifts of the Spirit that you need to walk in the way and to do what God wants you to do. I can't stress it enough. You grow in grace through the fruits of the Spirit. You learn to love your enemies and your neighbors, even your spouse, like Christ loves you through the fruit of the Spirit. You grow fruit of the joy of the Lord that is your strength by abiding in the vine, which is Christ, so that the sap will flow through you and produce that fruit. 
The Holy Spirit is in you if you are in Christ Jesus, not to just produce one or two of the fruits. He's there to produce them all in you. That's a package deal. And you can receive them all in this life. Growing up in Christ has very little to do with intellectual knowledge and study. In fact, contrary to popular opinion, growing up in Christ has everything to do with the Spirit producing His fruit in you. How does He do it? I don't have a clue. All I know is the last few years I've been asking for them, and I think I'm starting to see them. I see a little bit of a harvest. I see changes happening in me that I never wanted to happen because they caused me to do things that I never wanted to do. Such things as admitting I'm wrong or confessing my sins or giving up what I want to do so I can minister to other people. And I'm talking about people I don't even like or perhaps uh, simply learning to keep my mouth shut when I really want to say something. Those things are the fruits of the Spirit. I want to live the way I always have lived. But over the past few years, something is prohibiting that, and I can no longer be who I was. I've had to give up grudges and forgive people and ask for forgiveness. And my old man doesn't like that one bit. Every time that fruit is produced, he dies a little bit more. And you know what? I'm actually starting to enjoy reaping the harvest of the fruit of the Spirit. Even though I have taken a six-month exercise break so I could uh, finish a book I was working on, uh, and over the last four or five years, I've developed a love of exercise, or perhaps it's more accurate to say that I have developed a love of taking care of myself. I'm 59 years old, and for the first 50-plus years of my life, I refused to take care of myself. And it wasn't the threat of getting old or dying that made me do it. I don't mind either one of those things. I kind of like getting old, and I can't wait to be with my Father in heaven. But uh, it was a desire in me that knew that God still has plans for me here in this age. And if I was going to be able to do them, I needed to take care of myself. Now, I admit that the coronavirus has given me plenty of time to eat, so I've lost a little ground, but I'm planning on getting back in gear once this thing is over. For me, all of these things are the fruit of the Spirit, and I know that the Spirit of God who abides in me is transforming me from the inside that I might be more like Christ to those that I meet. That is the essence of of the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit and the gifts are not the only thing that the Holy Spirit does in us. Verse 13 says that in Christ, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, the good news of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantor, the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of His glory. The Holy Spirit is the seal of our inheritance. We know that we have an inheritance in Christ when the fruits of the Spirit are beginning to be produced in us. We also bear witness to the seal of the Spirit as the gifts of the Spirit are produced in our lives. The Spirit and His work in us are signs that our inheritance is guaranteed. Those things are signs. They're the signs because when we get to the next age, we won't need any of those things. Why? Because we'll be like Christ in every way. Here in this age is the only time that the fruits of the Spirit can grow in our lives. It's the only time when the gifts of the Spirit will be needed. Because in the next age, we will know as we have been known or are known. 
In this age, we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know fully, even as I have been known fully. Because we only know in part, we desperately need the fruits and gifts of the Holy Spirit to minister to us and to grow us up into all things in Christ. It is my prayer for those, all of those that watch this video, that God would stir your hearts to hunger and thirst for all that God has promised his children in this age. For this simple reason, that once this age is over, those fruits and gifts will have manifested their final work and we will be completely like Christ in every way. Paul continues on in verse 15. Because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love towards all the saints, for this reason I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, having your eye, the eyes of your heart enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? Let me stop there. I move the first couple of words uh, of that uh, passage to the middle because it seemed to make more sense to me. From my perspective, Paul's recognition of their faith and love towards the saints is the reason he continually gives thanks for them and remembers them in his prayers. He knows that they have faith in God, which is demonstrated by a love for all the saints. And for many in our day and age, that's enough. But Paul knows that we need more. He prays that God the Father would give them the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Faith and love are the entry points to salvation, not the end of it. In this age, we need to be gifted with the wisdom and revelation of God of the Spirit. Paul is not talking about knowing the Scriptures, but rather about applying the Word of God to everyday life. In other words, being wise in, relationship, in relation to things like loving your neighbor in the midst of a coronavirus, or having the wisdom to think of others as more important than yourself in this time of crisis, or for that matter, when we're not in a crisis. God is willing and able to give you answers and direction on how to do that here and now. Perhaps you haven't been willing to do those things when times were good. What is to stop you from calling out to God right now and asking him to do a work in your life by giving you wisdom and revelation now about how to live your day-to-day -day life? Part of that wisdom and revelation is to be able to taste and experience the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his great might. I'll stop there again. Because too often we think of the greatness of God's power towards us who believe, and we think that that is summed up in the forgiveness of sins. But the forgiveness of sins was accomplished before the resurrection. When Jesus said, it is finished, and breathed his last, all sin was paid for. The immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to his great might, happens after our sins are paid for. It is the power of the Spirit living in us to produce the fruits and gifts now in this age. That's uh, what we're talking about now, forgiveness of sins is already done and accomplished. All of your sins, even the ones you have not committed yet, have been forgiven in Christ. And they were forgiven almost 2,000 years ago. When Jesus sees you, he doesn't see anything except forgiveness. When God looks at you, he sees Jesus. He sees a perfect, whole being 
that was made to be exactly what it is. He loves you. He is not out to get you at every turn. Your sins have been paid for. Is that a license to sin? God, no. It is not. It is not. It is a license to walk in righteousness. You can't say, oh, I'm just made this way. That's why I keep going into sin. That's, that's not the way it works. You may have been that way. You weren't made that way, but that's how you developed over time. But since Christ has come into your life, you are no longer that old thing. You are no longer bound to those old sins. You are no longer under those things. You have been set free in Christ Jesus. You are holy and spotless and blameless, and I don't care what anybody else tells you. You are those things because that's what God says. We have to embrace those things or we will never get whole. We have to embrace who we are or we will never become what we're meant to be. And too, too, for too long, the church has said, there's nothing we can do about it until Jesus comes back. And that is a load of crap. You need to understand that. After the forgiveness of sins, God the uh, Father exalted Christ for his faithfulness by raising him from the dead. Yet that was not enough. That wasn't enough exaltation. Because after he raised him from the dead, and again, the sad part about all of that is that that's all we're hoping for, to get raised from the dead. We don't really care anything about anything else. Okay? Um, we're just hoping to be raised from the dead. But God has plans, plans to give us oh so much more. Because as soon as the Father raised Jesus from the dead, he seated him at the right hand of his, uh, his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the one to come. In other words, he exalt, God exalted Jesus by making him the highest authority in the created realm. And he is that now. He is not going to become that someday. He is Lord over heaven and earth right now. It is important to note that both heaven and earth are a part of creation. God needs neither one of them. God needs nothing. Anything that he talks about, <coughs> talks about in, the, in the word here is about the creation. He doesn't need anything that he created. He was perfectly fine. Just as he was. He was whole without any creation whatsoever, and yet he created the world, and now he's put Jesus Christ as the Lord, the King, the ruler over both heaven and earth. Jesus Christ, the man, is, as I said, Lord of heaven and earth. In other words, he, had become, he has become what the first Adam was supposed to be before he rebelled. Do you understand that Adam... The Adam and Eve from the, uh, from the Adam and Eve story was created so that he could be Lord over heaven and earth. We don't even think like that. But that's the whole point of Jesus coming and becoming a man because God in his wonderful plan has decided that human beings were to be <coughs> the rulers of both heaven and earth for him. God actually put all things, all created things under his feet and gave him as head over all things. Jesus Christ is already head over all things. Angels, demons, sinners, saints, the rest of creation in both realms, heaven and earth. But it doesn't stop there. God gave all of that to Jesus. And then he gave Jesus... To all who will believe, the assembly of believers, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. 
That is an amazing passage. The assembly of believers is, is the fullness of him who fills all in all. Not in the future. Jesus is not only Lord in the future. He is Lord now. He, through the Holy Spirit, is Lord over demons and angels, believers and unbelievers. It's not angels who are to fill up, fill up the fullness. It is redeemed humanity. We are to bring the fullness of the great king into being. The time between times that we are now in is the only time in history that we can grow that fullness. Because once you get fullness, you can't add to it. It's full. Here, now, in this life, is the only time that we, through what we do in our obedience, can add to the fullness of Jesus Christ. It's the only time that we can wage warfare for our Lord. This is the only time that we can grow in faith. It's the only time that we will have the opportunity to grow the fruits of the Spirit. The only time that we'll be able to operate in the gifts of the Spirit in order to fight the good fight. I want you to understand that God is not in a hurry to end this age. He has been waiting on his son's girlfriend to be all that she is supposed to be so that she'll be a worthy bride for all eternity. You know, I, I'm not sure how we started to believe that it didn't make any difference what our condition was and started thinking that Jesus was going to come back instantaneously and transform his son's girlfriend into a worthy bride. You don't turn... Uh, never mind. What a slap in the face to all of those who've been slaughtered for their allegiance to Christ. Revelation 19.7 is very clear. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory for the marriage of the lamb has come. And this is the part that's very important because his bride has made herself ready. How long until we make ourselves ready for our Lord? Too, for too long, We've been sitting out on our behinds saying, boy, I can't wait till Jesus comes back so that I can be what I'm supposed to be in Christ. You stay with that attitude, you're never going to be a part of the fullness of Christ. So now, right here, where we are, in this time and in this place, is where the gospel is to be applied to our hearts. This is where we make ourselves ready by humbling ourselves before the Father. It is the healing of our broken hearts that brings people to see the hope that is inherent in the work of Christ. It is not our arguments or our uh, skills at talking people and to people that does it. It is them seeing us being transformed. Words cannot and will not transform your heart. It is the healing of our broken heart that brings people to see the hope that is inherent in the work of Christ. He came and died so that the fruits and the gifts of the Spirit could be produced in us in order that we could move forward, move toward being made whole as we fight the good fight. This time, in this fall, is the only opportunity that we will have to fight the good fight. I, I don't think we realize that. This is the only time in history that human beings can fight the good fight. There is no fight in the next age. There's no fight at all. Here and now is the only time. When Christ returns, the war will be over. And we won't have to fight any more at all. Let's close with prayer. Oh, Father, do what is necessary to teach us how to fight by laying down our lives, 
Let us be Jesus, not in words alone, but with our lives. I ask this in the power and authority of God the Father. May we become the fullness of him who fills all in all, as your word promises. Please make it so. Amen.